foam effect is found under the simulation category and I'm gonna need a solid layer to apply this to. So I'll go up to layer, new, solid, and I'll call this foam. Click okay, go into the simulation category and then apply that effect. Now this is actually a really versatile effect that simulates these bubbles basically that kind of float out from a producer, but they interact with each other. They're not just randomly being placed throughout the scene. They can clump up, bounce off of each other, pop, distort. If I scrub through here and you just pick out maybe one of these bubbles, you can see that it's actually deforming and kind of jiggling the way that actual bubbles would. So let's walk through the controls and see what this effect can do for us. First of all, we have the view, which is set to draft. This is a quick way to preview your simulation with just kind of this wireframe view of the bubbles. But I could change this to draft plus flow map, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, or rendered, meaning the final version. So with this version, we're getting a lot more to each one of these bubbles. They have color, highlights, shadows. There's a lot more depth to them and it looks a lot more realistic. So if I play this again, you can see that these bubbles are interacting with each other in a very realistic way. All right, let's take a look at the producer category. This is where we set up the point that all of the bubbles are coming out of. So by default, it's right in the center of my layer, but I can move this around anywhere that I want. And that's the producer point. So if I wanted them on the left side of the screen, I could do that and they'll come out of that point. I'll move that back towards the center. And then we have the producer X size and producer Y size. So by default, these are very small, meaning that it's really just coming out of a single point. But if I really increase that X pretty far, it's gonna get a lot wider. I can only go up to a value of 0.45. Same thing on the Y. And if I switch my view back down to draft, we're gonna see this red circle around the outside. That is my producer. So I could make this any size that I want, maybe squish it down a little bit, and then even go to the next property, which is producer orientation, and rotate that around. So I could make this very narrow if I wanted to, and then put it at a specific angle, and the bubbles are gonna come out of that shape instead. Next up is zoom producer point, which is checked by default. And this has to do with another property down here, the zoom property. If I move my producer point to somewhere else on my comp that's further away from the center of the frame and use this zoom property to zoom in and out on the Z axis, then you can see that it's scaling up and down as we would expect it to, as if the camera was moving through Z space, that producer will also fly by the camera. If I uncheck zoom producer point, then it's just going to scale up or down basically. It's not going to be as accurate in terms of 3D space. So with that unchecked, it's basically scale. I'm gonna set that back down to default and check that box. And then next up we have the production rate. So let me reset some of these down to their defaults and I'll change this back to rendered and turn the production rate down. So the lower the number is, the less bubbles will be produced per second. If I crank that up, then we're gonna get a whole lot more set that back down to its default, and collapse up the producer and go into the bubbles. This is where we can shape what the bubbles actually look like. So we have a size control, which is just an average size. As you can see, there is variation, and that's because of the size variance property. So 0.5 is a lower number, but you can see that it does produce some pretty good variance. If I turn this down all the way to zero, all of the bubbles will be exactly the same size. Or if I really crank it up, then we're gonna get a whole lot of variation between all of these bubbles. And you can see now that because there are so many different sizes that some of the bubbles get shot out of the way, some of them even pop because the size of the bubble actually determines how it interacts with other bubbles around it. Lifespan is where we can determine how long these bubbles last before they pop. So if I turn it way down, they're not gonna travel very far before they start to pop. Or if I really turn it up all the way to its maximum, then they're gonna float off for a lot longer before disappearing. I'll reset that. Next, we have bubble growth speed which is how long it takes for the bubble to get to be its full size. So I'm gonna turn the size variance down a little bit so they're a little bit more uniform and turn the bubble growth speed way down. So down to a 0.3 and then play that back. You can see that the bubbles growing out is much more gradual now. Or if I increase it instead to a much higher number, they're really going to expand out and it's gonna be a little bit more chaotic because the faster these bubbles move, the more likely they are to pop. So that's why a lot of these bubbles are just kind of appearing and then popping. So I'll set that back to its default and next is strength. And this is basically the strength of the bubble itself. So how likely it is to pop. A higher number means it's less likely to pop and a lower number means it's very likely to pop. So the default is 10. If I turn this down to say two, then these bubbles are going to appear and then start popping really quickly. But if I increase that strength, then they're going to really stick around and will need a lot of collision in order to pop. 
So if I crank this all the way up to 100, then these bubbles really aren't going to pop. They're going to expand out, they're gonna to clump together, some of them will be pushed out, but it looks like a really big clump of actual bubbles. Okay, let's set that back down to its default, collapse up bubbles and go into physics. We have a lot of properties in this section and it all shapes how these bubbles are interacting in space. Our initial speed is set to zero, but if I increase that, then we're going to be able to kind of shoot these bubbles out. So this looks a little bit more like they're bubbles underwater that are floating up, maybe being shot out of some kind of an air pump. And I can adjust the initial direction as well. It doesn't have to be going straight up. So maybe I wanted to be shooting out to the side. I'll set this to 90 degrees and play that back. And now my bubbles are shooting off that way. We have a wind speed, which actually blows the bubbles. So if I increase this to be a higher number, my wind direction is set to 90 degrees. So it's going in the same direction that the initial speed is going. But if I change this to a value of zero, then the wind is going to be blowing them upwards. So let's really crank that up maybe turn that initial speed back. And now the bubbles are going to be shot out to the left, but the wind will blow them up. And I can add in some turbulence to that wind. If I increase that turbulence value, then that's basically going to randomize a lot of the direction of these bubbles, but it's also going to have them kind of wobble. So if I turn that up higher and higher, you'll see this a little bit better, that these bubbles are no longer traveling in kind of a straight arc. They're getting pushed around by that turbulence. I'm gonna lower that number a little bit and then go to the next option, which is wobble amount. This is the actual wobble of the bubble squashing and stretching basically. So if I increase that to a higher number, they're going to constantly be shifting between being squashed and stretched. A lower number generally looks a little bit better, so I'm gonna leave that at its default. Next up is the repulsion property, and this really does a lot to the bubbles. It kind of determines how they interact with each other. If I turn the value all the way down to zero, then they're really not gonna interact at all. And in fact, let me reset this back down to its default and then turn the repulsion all the way down. Play this back and you'll see that the bubbles are overlapping, passing through each other, and they're really not colliding at all. And the default value is already at the maximum of one. So the higher this number, the more they're going to interact. The lower it is, the less likely they are to bounce into each other. So I'm gonna turn that all the way back up to one because I think that's a little bit more realistic. And next we have pop velocity, and this one is very interesting. It basically determines what happens when a bubble pops. So I'm going to increase the bubble size and turn up the size variance a little bit so we get some bubbles that actually are popping. Okay, so we can see some popping there, and then I'm gonna turn up the pop velocity. And what this does is basically when a bubble pops, we can see it right about here. When that bubble popped right there, a bunch of other bubbles rushed to fill in the hole that it left behind. So the higher this number, the more surrounding bubbles are affected by bubbles that pop. So I'm gonna crank this all the way up to 10 and let's see what happens. So for one, bigger bubbles that pop cause a lot of other bubbles to pop. If that is really high, then we're basically losing a lot of bubbles. Maybe I should turn my size variance down quite a bit and maybe the overall size down just a bit. But now you can see that it's really popping a lot of other bubbles and surrounding bubbles are filling that hole. So I'm gonna turn that velocity down so it's not quite so extreme. And then maybe go to my producer and turn the production rate up so that we have many more bubbles being produced. Now this is going a little bit crazy, so I should probably go into my bubbles section and turn up the strength so that they don't pop quite as often. Now something I wanna point out as I'm messing with these values this far into my comp, this simulation has to be calculated from the first frame and one frame at a time after that. So if you're changing a bunch of settings eight seconds into your comp, it might take a little bit for After Effects to update. But if we go back to the beginning, it shouldn't take that long to re-preview it. All right, so I think that pop velocity is too high, so I'm gonna turn that down to a value of maybe two, and my producer's probably way more than I need. So let's turn that up to maybe 1.5. And I could probably turn the strength of the bubbles down just a little bit, so maybe around 15. All right, next up is viscosity. And this is basically how quickly the bubbles decelerate after they're produced. So you can kind of think of this like bubbles being within a liquid. So if they're in like an aquarium, it's not that hard for bubbles to travel through water. They move pretty fluidly through that liquid. But if it was something thicker like paint or honey, those bubbles are gonna move a lot slower. And that's what viscosity is. So if I turn this up higher, it's going to be a much thicker liquid basically. 
a more viscous liquid. So they're clumping up a lot more, they're not drifting off as much, and the wind is really what's pushing them off screen at this point. So if I go back to the wind speed and turn that completely off, then they're just gonna be produced and kind of clump up. And I can really crank up that viscosity to keep them all in this one singular place. So this kind of looks like bubbles being, you know, produced in a bathtub at the top of the water, and eventually they get big enough and one pops and makes a bunch of the other ones pop. Now I can increase my initial speed and that will have the bubbles being shot outwards before clumping up and getting stuck in that viscosity. Or I could turn that down so that it's not quite as much. But as you can see, this is a very realistic looking set of bubbles. It's very cool and it's an effect that I've never really seen used before and I think it's absolutely worth understanding how it works so that you can start actually using it. Because really, why would you ever use an effect if you don't understand what it can do? All right, next up is stickiness. And just like it sounds, this is how sticky these bubbles are, how much they're gonna stick together. So if I turn it all the way down and turn my viscosity back down to its default of 0.1, as well as my initial speed down to a default of zero, the bubbles really are just gonna fly out. They'll interact in terms of being pushed around by each other, but they're not gonna stick to each other anymore. So this is more like air bubbles, less like soap bubbles. But if I turn this value up really high, then these bubbles are really gonna start clumping together sticking together and not moving out nearly as much. Now, I might need to go into my bubbles, turn up the strength a little bit so that they don't pop so easily, but I can play this back again, and now we're getting a real nice clump of bubbles here around that producer point. And again, if you don't want them drifting off so much, we could grab that viscosity, turn that up, and now they're going to be a lot less likely to drift off, but still interact in a pretty realistic way. All right, that's it for the physics, and we've already looked at zoom, which again just zooms in or out on our bubble simulation. But next up we have universe size. I'm gonna switch this back to the draft view again and turn that universe size down. And you'll see this square that's aligned to the width of the comp. And this is basically how far out the simulation is allowed to be visible. So if I turn this down, bubbles are never going to go beyond that box. So if you need to contain the bubbles into a certain size, this is one way that you can do it. Or if you really want those bubbles to be able to go out far, then you can crank that number up higher than one. And depending on how you set up your simulation, those bubbles can really drift off outside of the comp. I'll put that back down to a default to one and change this back to rendered. And the next section is rendering. And this is where we can really dial in what the bubbles actually look like. So I'm gonna zoom in nice and close on one of these bigger bubbles and take a look at the blend mode. Currently it's set to transparent, meaning that these bubbles are rendering on top of transparency. There's nothing behind them. But if I turn on my transparency grid and unsolo this and change the blend mode to solid old on top, what that means is that older bubbles stay on top of newer bubbles. So I'll turn this back to transparent and then solid old on top. And you see that some of the bubbles are appearing on top of others a lot more clearly. And if I change it to solid new on top, then the newer bubbles will be rendered on top of older bubbles. I'm gonna switch that back to transparent. And you can especially see right here in the overlap if I undo and redo how it's blending those bubbles together a little bit differently. All right, next up is bubble texture and it's set to default bubble, but I could change this to a lot of different options. So I'm not gonna go through every single one of these, but it drastically changes the look of each one of these bubbles. And I'm gonna make a grid really quickly just so we can see what this looks like behind everything. So I'll add a grid effect, change it to width slider and put it below the foam so we can see how these bubbles are interacting. It's not actually distorting what's behind it, but it is blending with transparency on top of it. So like I said, there are a lot of options in here. I'm gonna just let you explore all of them, but they change the colors and the shading of the actual bubble texture but I can also change this to user defined, which will allow me to choose a bubble texture layer to apply to each one of these simulated bubbles. And this can literally be any layer in your composition. So I'm just gonna start by grabbing my logo as an example, I'll turn that off, we don't need to see it, and then choose that layer as my bubble texture layer. So there's my logo, suddenly these bubbles are replaced with my logo. So I'll play that back and you can see that all of the bubble simulation has been applied to my logo and it looks pretty great. Now I could take this even further and bring my logo back up, maybe add a lens effect, CC lens, maybe turn the convergence down a little bit so it's just kind of warping it spherically, unsolo that, go back to my foam and make sure to choose effects and masks under the bubble texture layer, and now it will have that warping to it. 
but all the other simulation controls are being applied to the bubbles just like before. So if you wanna make a custom bubble shape, you absolutely can and just choose that as your bubble texture layer. Now bubble orientation is set to fixed by default, meaning it's not going to apply any rotation, which is why all of my logo heads are facing the same direction. But if I change this from fixed to physical orientation, then the bubbles are going to spin around and be a lot more chaotic. They're interacting with the other bubbles and being spun around based on what's happening in the simulation. The other option is bubble velocity. And this is kind of orienting each bubble in the direction that it's moving. And this is pretty chaotic as well. But if I were to say, move this over to the left, increase my initial speed and direction, and maybe that initial speed is a little bit too much. Now they're all going to be oriented in the direction that they're moving. So whatever I set that initial direction to, that's where my logo is going to be facing. All right, I'm gonna undo that and get back to where we were and I'll set that bubble orientation back to fixed. Next is environment map. And this is basically a reflection layer. So I'm gonna bring out this photo of an aquarium and just drag it to the bottom. Again, we don't need to see this, we just need to reference it in the comp and choose that as my environment map. Then I need to turn up my reflection strength. So I'll increase that value. And you can see that that photo is now being reflected in each one of my logos. Now this is gonna make a lot more sense with something a little bit more defined like a bubble. So I'm gonna change this back to default bubble and then turn that reflection strength down and back up so you can see what's happening. Now, I think this looks a little bit better if I actually place it over top of the photo itself. So I'm gonna leave that layer on and now those bubbles are blending in with that reflection layer a lot more realistically. Now it is a little hard to see the bubbles, so I might wanna add, say, a curves effect and make them all a little bit brighter or just give it a little bit more contrast so that they stand out from the background a little bit better. And we have another control for that reflection as well, which is the reflection convergence. And this is basically how distorted the reflection is within the bubble. So if I dial that back or turn it up, you can see how it's being affected within each one of those bubbles. All right, that's it for rendering. Next up is flow map. And if you've ever used a displacement map or a bump map inside of After Effects, it's very similar, a grayscale image that drives the flow of the foam simulation. So we can kind of shape where we want these bubbles to go based on a grayscale image. So I'm gonna get rid of that curves, reset the effect back down to default, turn off that photo, and change this to draft plus flow map. And then I'm going to make another new solid layer. And I'll call this flow map. And on top of that, I'm going to make a new shape layer with a stroke that will just make it white. And with the pen tool, I'm just gonna draw this curvy shape across my comp and I'll make it nice and thick, bring this out so we don't see that harsh edge and then pre-compose these two layers together. So I'm gonna make this nice and smooth and then grab the flow map in that shape layer, Control Shift C or Command Shift C on a Mac and I'll call this flow map one more time, making sure to move all the attributes and click OK. I'll hide that layer and then use that as my flow map within the flow map controls. So choose that layer. And because I have draft plus flow map as my view, I'm able to see that flow map right in the simulation. Now the way that foam is reading a flow map is white being the highest point of the map. So if you imagine we're looking from the top down on this map, white is highest, black is lowest. So these bubbles are being produced on top of basically a wall. But if I click and drag my flow map to the bottom left, then you can see the bubbles are now bouncing off of that wall or popping. They're not going beyond it. So I'm able to contain the bubbles within this lower half of the frame. Or if I moved it up here to the top, same thing, they'll be contained within that top section. Now, pure white doesn't mean that it's absolutely never going to cross it. It just means that it's less likely to cross it. But if I were to go into my bubbles and turn up the strength to their max, and then go into the physics and crank up that initial speed, you can see that bubbles shooting against that wall are kind of split 50-50 between bouncing off them and moving across them. So you can shape where the bubbles go with a flow map, but you can also break through it if that's something that you wanna do. Let me undo back to where we were and then add a fast box blur to the flow map. Now I need to go back to foam and choose effects and masks under the flow map source. But now if I blur this out a little bit, we're gonna get a gradient between the gray parts and the white parts of our flow map. So I'm really gonna crank this up and now everything is gonna be a lot softer. 
the bubbles are going to basically kind of roll up and back down this curve rather than just bouncing off really harshly. But let's say I wanted to contain it within that line. Well, then I could invert so that black becomes white and white becomes black and then move that producer point into the center of that line. And these bubbles are now going to expand out and basically fill out that line being contained within it. So let me change this to my rendered view and we can now see these bubbles flowing throughout that shape that I drew. So if you wanted to fill up a custom shape or even your logo with bubbles or foam, you can use a flow map to do exactly that. Now we also have this property for flow map steepness. This is basically creating contrast between the light and dark portions of your flow map. So if I increase this, then imagine the highest points of your map becoming much higher. So these bubbles are now much less likely to expand out beyond the boundaries. And if I turn it way down low, then they're going to be much more likely to be able to cross that threshold and move beyond where you're trying to contain them. So if I really turn this down low, then they're pretty much not going to be contained anymore. But if you find that sweet spot where some bubbles drift out, but the majority stay within, then you get a nice looking effect. And let's say that you wanted them to travel along this kind of like a pipe. Well, I'm gonna move it to the left edge right where that starts and then turn up my initial speed as well as change the initial direction so that it's kind of angled along that path. I'll need to dial up my steepness a little bit higher, but now these bubbles are going to travel kind of along this path. So I'm gonna increase that initial speed to maybe four, change back to my rendered view, and now these bubbles are flowing across that path that I made. And if I really wanted to go crazy, I could increase that production rate up to maybe two, turn the bubble size down to 0.25, and maybe the size variance down to 0.25, and then I could probably even increase the production rate a little bit higher, and I'm gonna get a ton of tiny bubbles traveling along that path. I'll go back into my flow map controls, turn that steepness up a bit so they're contained a little bit more tightly. And if we use a custom bubble, we could even change this to something like a blood cell. And this could be a simulation of blood traveling through a vein. Or you could get really creative and maybe make another custom texture for birds flying and flocking together and moving around or a swarm of bees. There's a whole lot of possibilities here for very dynamic and pretty realistic simulations. Now there's one more flow map control, which is this flow map fits control. It's set to universe, but we could change it to screen. And this basically fits your flow map to one of the two options. So universe means that it will scale with the zoom size, whereas screen means that it's not going to scale at all. So with that set to screen, the flow map stays the size of the comp and the bubble simulation moves through it basically as I adjust the zoom but universe means that it's going to scale up and down with it, which again, we can see better in the draft plus flow map view. So this is universe and this is screen. If I dial back the zoom, you can see that the flow map is locked in place and with universe, it scales down with it. All right, set that back to default, change this to rendered and close up flow map. And finally, we have simulation quality in random seed. Simulation quality has normal, high, and intense, and this, like it sounds, just increases the accuracy of the simulation. So I'm gonna turn it up to high. Uh, this will take longer to render, but as you can see, it's playing back pretty much in real time. It's not that bad, but if I change this to intense, then it'll take a little bit longer. I do have a pretty powerful processor, so this is not taking much of a hit, but the more bubbles you have, the more complex your simulation, the longer this will take. So beware of that. And then finally, random seed is just going to give a randomization to every single bubble as you increase that value. So you can change this anywhere between zero and 16 to choose a random starting point. Maybe you wanna run two of the same simulation where the second one doesn't have quite as many bubbles and it has much bigger size. I'll turn the production rate much lower and then I could change the random seed just to vary it up a little bit. But with that, we've covered all the controls of foam. Again, a very powerful simulation effect that I feel like not a lot of people are aware of or think about how they can use beyond just making bubbles. The ability to change the actual bubble texture layer to be anything at all is what makes this so powerful. And if you don't like the wobbliness, just go into the physics, turn that wobble amount all the way down and it won't distort your layers. Let me get rid of that second copy. Again, change my bubble texture to user to find and choose my logo as the layer. Go into the bubble size and increase it. Turn the producer rate back down. There we go, now make that a little bit bigger. And then go into the physics and just turn the wobble mount all the way down. 
And now I just have this stream basically of my logo moving throughout that flow map. It's actually a lot of fun to play around with and you should absolutely get in here and start messing around with it yourself. But that's everything you need to know about the foam effect. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this tutorial, then check out the other ones here on my YouTube channel. And if you like my teaching style, then definitely check out my longer form content on Skillshare and School of Motion. And if you wanna support more tutorials like this one, check out my Patreon. You can find links for all that stuff in the description of this video.